Now, if you have the word of God in your hand, could we turn, please, first of all, to Genesis chapter number 15. I'd like to read some verses, some short verses across the word of God this evening. The first is found in Genesis chapter number 15. Genesis chapter 15 and verse number 15. And the Lord speaking to Abram, and he says, And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Just that little phrase, thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Then over, please, to the book of Isaiah and chapter number 9. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, a familiar verse for many in the meeting this evening. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Then over in the book of Isaiah to chapter 49, or 48 rather, sorry. The last verse in Isaiah chapter 48. Isaiah 48 and verse 22 says, There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. And then just over a number of chapters to Isaiah 57. Again, the last verse, just would seek to read it for emphasis. Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 21. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And then one final reading, please, in the book of Romans in chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's all we are going to read from the word of God, and we trust his blessing upon his precious word this evening. No doubt for all young and old in the meeting tonight will we'll be able to grasp the, the theme and the thought and the little thread that is upon my mind for the gospel tonight. And it's the theme of peace, peace. And I thought just of that occasion when the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to his disciples and he said to them at the close of John chapter 16, he said that in me ye might have peace. And really, that's what we would seek to impress upon every individual that is under the sound of our voice this evening, that true peace, scriptural peace, can only be found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what I would like to do is just to speak to you on a number of things that, that have drawn my attention from the verses that we have read together. I want to speak, first of all, about the picture of peace. And there we'll just draw some, some thoughts from those two repetitive verses that we read in Isaiah, that there is no peace, saith the Lord, or saith my God, to the wicked. And we are going to just to seek to understand what that really means for the soul tonight that isn't saved. Then I would like to, to speak on a grand subject the lovely title that is given to the Lord Jesus Christ there in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, the Prince of Peace. And really, there's no other individual, no other person that could ever bear such a great and grand title as the Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. And then I would seek, just as the Lord gives help, to, to think something about the possession of peace, because we read there in Romans chapter 5, the last verse together, we, and the Apostle Paul is speaking about believers, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll seek just to discover what that really means and how can a soul have peace with God. And then just to, to draw it to a close, I would like to say something about the prospect of peace. You see, for the soul that's saved and the soul that has found refuge in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's a great prospect associated with the peace that they enjoy. And just there in, in Genesis 15, the very first mention that we have of peace in our Bibles, the Lord said to Abram, 
Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. And what a prospect it was for Abram to know that when life ended on earth, he could go unconcerned because he was resting on the, on the person of God. And so, first of all, I would like just to, to consider the picture of peace. And it would do well, as I recognize there are some younger folk in our midst this evening, just to, to define what peace really is, just so that we all can grasp what it is that we're, we're seeking to speak about this evening when we say peace and having peace with God. You know, many might ask the question, you see, what does peace look like or how can I obtain peace? And you see, you might go and take up a dictionary and read there some of the definitions that a dictionary might propose of peace. And you might see the words calm or tranquility as an artist might take his pen and paint that a beautiful scene where the, the ocean is calm and the sun is setting and perhaps in the distance there's there's sheep grazing on a, on a hill undisturbed and some might just think that's just the idea of peace, calm and tranquility. And others might come and define peace as, well, the absence of, of strife or the absence of, of war. And if it were to take the, the conditions in the world that are around us, if, if things were all stable in Ukraine, if there was no fractions and frictions in the government, whether in our own land here or across the UK as a whole, some might say, well, peace just looks like harmony one with another, the absence of peace, the absence of strife and, and so forth. But you know, I want just you to understand, though that's what the world might call peace, I want to define for you what scriptural peace looks like. And really, a true picture of scriptural peace can be, can be understood by, by the artist's paintbrush. You know, there was a man by the name of Jack Dawson, and he painted a picture, and he called it peace in the midst of a storm. And really, it is a beautiful illustration of scriptural peace. And if you were to, to Google the picture after the meeting, it, it might bring it to light even, even more. But what he painted was a raging storm. And there in that raging storm, there was the sea and the waters, and it was thundering over the sides of the cliff as a waterfall. And there he painted dark clouds. It was gloomy and dark. And there we see the thunder striking down upon the land. And you might say, well, that's no picture of peace. But you see, in the midst of that, in the midst of the thundering water, in the midst of the dark clouds, in the midst of the thunder that was striking down, as you take a closer glance, what you'll find is this, that there in the cleft of a rock, he had painted just a beautiful picture, a little white dove. And there that little white dove was just sitting, resting in the cleft of the rock. And there it was, the water rushing down the cliff, the dark clouds, the doom and the gloom. But there was a dove, secure, resting with refuge in the rock, needing not worry about the conditions round about. You see, that was a picture of true peace, the dove resting in the cleft of the rock. And you know, my friends, this evening, that's really the picture of peace, it's the soul that's resting in the cleft of the rock, which is Christ Jesus. Needn't worry about the sin that is coming and men and women will be judged for in eternity because the sinner that is saved is resting there in the refuge and in the rock, which is Christ Jesus. What a picture of perfect peace. And yet, friends, we read in our Bibles tonight and I read it twice to emphasize it. In fact, I want to emphasize it even more than just twice. We read those words, there is no rest or there is no peace for the wicked. There is no peace for the wicked. And you see, that's what tonight the word of God and what I would seek to do is to impress upon your soul. If you're not saved tonight, you don't have peace. And you'll never have peace but for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
You know, Isaiah, it's 66 chapters. And some have said that it just aligns itself beautifully with the, with the word of God itself. 66 books. And the first 39 books, or the first 39 chapters, that's the Old Testament in Isaiah. And then the remaining 27, well, that's the New Testament. And you know, in that New Testament section of Isaiah, at the end of every ninth chapter, really the thing that echoes upon the page of Scripture is no peace. At the end of chapter 48, we read it, no peace. At the end of chapter 57, we read it, no peace. At the end of chapter 66, we didn't read it, but what it says is this, for their worm dieth not, neither shall their fire be quenched. Effectively what it's saying, for the soul that ends in hell, no peace, no peace, no peace. And you know, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, he echoed those words. If you were to go again another nine chapters and to go to the ninth chapter of Mark, three times the Lord Jesus Christ said this. Three times he said this about the place of everlasting destruction, the place hell. He said, where the fire or where the worm dieth not and where the fire is not quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And don't you see it, friend, tonight, impressed upon Scripture. For the soul that's not saved, the Old Testament in Isaiah, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, what does he say? They're going to a place, no peace, no peace, no peace. And you know, my friends, tonight, the word of God is searching. And there's no nice way that we can really dress it up for you. Because the word of God impresses upon our soul the very seriousness of your condition. Some of the terms that we find enemies of God. Romans chapter 3 tells us guilty before God. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us dead in sins and in trespasses. In fact, Romans 3, quoting from Isaiah, says that the sinner has not known the way of peace. And what we would seek just for you to grasp tonight is the very seriousness of your condition, the very seriousness of sin. Whether young or whether old, sin must be dealt with. And if you don't have your sins forgiven in time, you'll be punished for eternity with no peace. No peace. The very picture of peace resting in the rock, but if not in a future day, as our Bible tells us that it's appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. If you're not resting in the rock, which is Christ Jesus, it's not the the thundering waters or the dark clouds or the thunder that, or the lightning that you need to worry about. But it's the very place which Second Thessalonians speaks of, of everlasting destruction. The picture of peace. I want to speak just for a moment on the grand theme of the Prince of Peace. Because there we read together that lovely title associated with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Prince of Peace. And really what it is, is this, it's really the prince that gives peace. For friends, tonight the Lord Jesus Christ is the very source of peace and eternal peace. And you know, isn't it not just something of a beautiful, a beautiful reminder of the very heart of God, that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, And the one that he sent to be the savior of the world is the one who gives peace. He's the one who is the very prince of peace. And again, if I might just lend another verse from Isaiah, just to paint that picture of how Christ is the very source of peace, I would take you to Isaiah chapter 53, a verse that was quoted in the prayer meeting, a verse that I'm sure many of the boys and girls and older friends could quote tonight. 
He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripe we are healed. And you see that little phrase there, with, or the chastisement of our peace was upon him. It's just taking me to the place called Calvary. It's taking me to the place where the Lord Jesus Christ suffered and bled and died and shed his precious blood. You know, when I read those words, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, what it's really saying is this, that the punishment that was necessary to secure a sinner's peace with God was laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see, my friends, tonight, that's why he is the Prince of Peace, because the punishment that was necessary so that you could have peace with God was laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ when he hung on that cross at Calvary for six hours. And when he cried those words, it is finished, what he was announcing was this, that what God demanded for sin had been fully paid. And when God raised him from the dead the third day, what was being announced was this, that God was satisfied with the price that was paid. And this evening I can tell you with no shadow of a doubt that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace, the very source of it, because of what he accomplished at the place called Calvary. The picture of peace, the Prince of Peace, Christ is the source because of Calvary. Just for a moment, I would like to speak to you about the possession of peace. Because that verse tells us in new and in certain clear terms what, what a soul can have. And there's many here tonight that they could say, we have peace with God. And what a great possession it is. Many today will seek peace, whether it be in, in riches, whether it be in the entertainment of this world. But my Bible tells me clearly how a soul can have eternal peace. You see, we read at the opening of that verse, it says, being justified by faith. By faith. By faith, we have peace with God. And you know, friends, tonight you can have peace with God by the moment that you exercise faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You might ask, what is faith? Some have said, well, taking it in its little acrostic, that faith is forsaking all, I trust him. And faith is coming to that point in your life when you recognize that I want nothing else, I need nothing else, there's nothing else that I can depend on for eternity but the Lord Jesus Christ. And the soul that's going to exercise faith in Christ and be saved is a soul that comes with two empty hands and recognizing nothing will do but Christ. And there they, they place their faith and trust in him, taking him at his word, resting upon his finished work, knowing that the price is paid and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth from all sin. And the moment, as our verse tells us, the moment that a soul exercises faith in Christ, they're justified by faith and have peace with God. You know what that means, friend? Especially for the younger ones in our meeting, it means this, that the moment that you exercise faith in Christ, every charge of guilt that is upon you for sin is removed. And God declares you righteous and justified. And at the moment that he does that, the very barrier that separates you from God is removed. And you've been brought into that right relationship with God. And you are, as it were, that little dove resting in the cleft of the rock, knowing that your security, knowing that your safety, knowing that your refuge is not resting upon yourself but resting 
upon the eternal Son of God. And that's it, friends. When you exercise faith, then that great possession of salvation will come. And that's what it was. And perhaps I would just mention that for, for there are younger ones in our midst, and that was what it was for me, because it's a good thing to be a younger, a younger friend in a gospel meeting, because God has an interest in you. You know, I was a, a little boy, and I was saved at the age of 10. At the age of 10, on a Monday afternoon, kneeling down on my bedside, it was there that I put my faith and trust in Christ. And here we are over 22 years later, still resting on the finished work of Christ, still trusting upon him. And my friends, I've never looked back and there's no greater thing than your soul's salvation. And that's what you can have tonight, peace with God. The picture of peace, the prince of peace, the possession of peace. I want to close and just speak for a moment about the prospect of peace. It's a great prospect when you're saved. You know, I've mentioned it already, the first occasion in our Bibles, but there we have it. You see, before the Lord ever spoke these words to Abram, earlier in the chapter, we'll read those words that Abraham believed God. And then there in chapter 15, or verse 15 of the chapter, there the Lord says to Abram, Thou shalt go to thy father's in peace. What a great promise that God had given to Abram. Abram need not worry about eternity. Abram need not worry about death. The Lord had given him a great promise that he would go to his fathers in peace. He would go to his fathers unconcerned. And you see, it's a great thing when you're saved because you need not worry about death. Resting upon this great truth that when you cross the threshold of death into the world which is to come, knowing that you will there be absent from the body, but present with the Lord. Present with the Lord. What a prospect it is for the soul that's saved. What a press prospect it could be for you tonight. You could come in, have come into this meeting not saved, but you could go out of this meeting not only with the great possession of peace with God, but you could go, as it were, skipping down the lane with a great prospect for eternity. And you can have it tonight by simple faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, just as I close, could I, could I leave those, those searching words upon your hearts? Trust that the Spirit of God will impress them upon your soul if you're not saved. There is no peace, saith the Lord, for the wicked. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. But know of a surety that the Prince of Peace can give you life tonight and give you salvation when you exercise faith and you can leave tonight being justified by faith and have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it's nice to be here again in Ballyclare. And like Paul has done, we give you all a warm welcome to our meeting. <clears throat> Ezekiel, please, we'll turn to the scriptures again. Ezekiel chapter 33. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 33. And verse 2 says, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land... If the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchman, if when he saith the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. Now the last four words of verse 7 says, five words says, and warn them from me. And warn them from me. Verse 11 says, say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, 
but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? And we'll turn please to Acts chapter 16. I hadn't planned to read it, but it certainly comes to the mind now. It does no harm to read. Acts 16 and verse 30 says, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And we trust that God will bless the reading of his precious word. <clears throat> I know maybe in Ballyclare you've got used to a shorter meeting, maybe quite often to one man. And I can assure you that it, give me 10 or 15 minutes and I'll have you out early. I only <clears throat> want to leave before you these thoughts that have been upon my mind very simply this evening for this meeting in Ballyclare. You know, today has been a very important day. It was, it's been talked about for weeks. If you pay attention to the news, or maybe you speak to some of your friends, you've spoken about today. Because today at three o'clock, I'm sure you heard or you waited for to hear your phone buzzing and to see the message coming up about the warning. And it was just a notification to prepare people for a warning. It says something about the world that we live in today, doesn't it? It's not, nor, it's not now dreaded, but rather expected that awful times will come. And the government have sent out a message, just, I believe, <clears throat> just for the purpose of if there was something to happen in Ballyclare tonight, you would get a notification to your phone to say, you're near Ballyclare, avoid Ballyclare. Something bad is happening. And so they've done this just to alert our phones and to get us used to this message coming through. It's a warning. In fact, in the message, if you read the message, it talked about warning of a hazardous or, or violence, something like this, to warn people. I'm here tonight, friend, and it has been upon my heart to come here and to warn you, to warn you, dear people. We've read of this passage in Ezekiel chapter 33 about a man who was to sound the trumpet of warning. You see, all those years ago, they didn't have iPhones and notifications. There was a man that stood at the corner of the village on the, on the top of a wall like they are on a tower. And if he seen danger coming, he would blow the trumpet to warn the people and to let them know danger was coming. Get ready, because danger is coming. You know, friend, the first thing I want to speak to you tonight about is a warning that danger is coming. A warning that the sword is about to fall. Judgment is coming. Some of you dear people here now, how many years have you been in your sins? How many years have you lived a life contrary to the word of God? A life of unrighteousness, friend. How many years has it been? Judgment is coming. I'm here tonight to sound the warning. Friend, if you were to go out to eternity tonight to meet God, you're not ready. Judgment is coming. There's some of you dear people now, and I look down into your eyes, and I don't know very many, only a few, but I heard your names mentioned in the prayer meeting. And I know you've been long prayed for. You've been long thought about. You know this gospel very well. Even some of the youngest here, from Sunday school days, from your very earliest moments in life, you were taught the scriptures. You were sang to from the gospel hymn book. You were read to from the good word of God. And you know that you live a life contrary to the word of God. You know that you're a sinner, friend. The Bible tells us that all have sinned. You know, I'm not here to try and uplift myself as any good person. I am maybe of all the people here the worst. I, I'm a sinner. I was a sinner. I was born in sin. And I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. I was born a sinner. And you've been born a sinner. But friend, the pressing issue is tonight, how are you going to die, friend? If this was your last night on earth, how will you go out to meet God? Will you go out in your sin? The Bible says all have sin and come short of the, the glory of God. We could meet some of, of the best people tonight on earth, and we could uplift them as good people, people who spend their lives working for charity, people who would seek to do good. And yet, friend, in the eyes of God, they're not ready to die. If they were to die, it would be judgment and hell and the lake of fire for all eternity. You might say you're really laboring the point. I understand, friend, I'm not here to be hard but I want to be true to the word of God. Judgment is coming. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. 
Friend, are you ready to meet God tonight? If this was your last night on earth, are you ready to meet him? You'll go out to meet a sin-hating God. Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel, said the prophet. Are you ready to meet him, friend? This was a word of warning. The trumpet would sound. The people needed to get ready, friend. It's time you were getting ready. I not only want to speak tonight about the warning, but I want to speak about the way of escape. You know, we read about these people, these two groups of people who heard the trumpet blow, who heard the warning. And we read about some who ignored the trumpet. And the Bible says their blood shall be upon their own head. We read about others. And it says if they took heed to the trumpet, it says at the end of verse 5, that they would they shall deliver his soul. Deliver his soul from the coming judgment. I want to tell you tonight, friend, with joy in my soul, although my face might betray me, I want to tell you tonight, friend, we have good news for you. We have good news. We have not just come to Valley Clare just to sound a warning and tell you of your sin and your awfulness in the eyes of God. But I'm here to tell you tonight, friend, that God has a way of escape for you. God has a way that you can be saved and know your sins forgiven. You say, how could, how could it be? Someone so wretched, someone so awful in the eyes of God, someone who is a sinner. Friend, I love the words of John 3.16, and yet it's a marvel to my soul every time I quote them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why did he love us? Why did he love us so much that he would send his only son from the splendors and glories of heaven, that one would come, that one who was deserving of angels' praise, and yet a day came when he left the scenes of glory. He was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. And he was born in a manger at Bethlehem. And then throughout his life, he proved himself to be the Son of God. He was holy, harmless, separate from sinners. He was set apart. He was a man that never sinned. He was a man that could not sin because he was sinless. He was the sinless, spotless Son of God. And yet, friend, the reason he was here... And the reason he was proving himself to be the son of God, that was that one day he might go outside the city walls of Jerusalem and he would bear your sin in his own body upon the tree. Thank God tonight, friend, I can tell you there's escape from the warning, from the sword that's about to fall, from the judgment that is coming. There's a way of escape. It's through the Lord Jesus Christ. I have read those words in Acts chapter 16 and verse 30. That Philippian jailer brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They could tell him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You know, maybe there's someone here tonight and many times you've thought about being saved. Maybe there's someone here tonight and many times you've tried to be saved. You've went home and you've read through the scriptures. You've read through tracts and other things. And you've thought these things over in your mind and you've tried and tried, friend, and nothing just seemed clear to you. I want to tell you tonight, friend, get your, get your eyes away from your own attempts and get your eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ, the lovely man of Calvary, the one who outside those city walls of Jerusalem bore your sin in his own body upon the tree. Let me tell you, friend, tonight there's salvation for you. God, God would love to save you. God desires to save you. We have a God in heaven and he would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Friend, God desires to save you tonight and he paid such a cost to save you when he sent his son into this world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. His son accomplished that finished work and now God is just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Is there someone here and you would love to be saved? You would love to be safe from coming judgment, friend. We point you to Christ. He's borne your every sin in his own body upon the tree. He's paid the penalty of your redemption. And friend, if you're going to be saved, you just put your trust in him. Get focused upon him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And God says, thou shalt be saved. <clears throat> A warning that was sounded. Judgment was coming. A way of escape. Thank God a way of escape has been provided for you and for me. Christ has died. None may perish, all may live, for Christ has died. I want to finally think of the whosoever in the verse here. You see, there's, there's a, <clears throat> you're responsible, there's responsibility here, friend. It says in verse 4, 
Whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet, whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet. I want to ask you again, friend, how many times, how many years have you been sitting in your sin in Ballyclare Gospel Hall? You've heard the sound of the trumpet many times. You've heard God's glorious gospel many times. You've heard how you could be saved many times. Maybe there's somebody here and you've wanted to be saved many times. Friend, I want to tell you that you're responsible tonight for what you will do with Christ and God's Son. You are responsible. No one else. Maybe there's someone here tonight and you're the, you're the son or, or daughter of praying parents. Maybe there's someone here and you've been long prayed for by the saints of Ballyclare. Let me tell you, friend, they'll never be able to save you. It will never gain you favor with God. If you're to die, you will go out to meet a sin-hitting God in your sin, friend. You're responsible. Man is responsible for what they will do with the message of the gospel and what they will do with God's only son. I was thinking today how, how great it is, how great a privilege it is for men and women, boys and girls in Bally Gospel, Bally Clare Gospel Hall to hear the word of God opened another time. I think often of the words of the Lord Jesus when he said, Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. He, he spoke about Capernaum, exalted many times to heaven, and yet it will fall to the depths of hell. Friend, I wonder if there's someone here tonight and you're going to lose your soul and you're going to go into God's judgment for all eternity. Come from a Christian home. Come from save godly parents. Come many times to the gospel hall. Many times wanted to be saved and yet you will lift up your eyes in hell being in torments. Friend, I think of the words of the hymn writer. We'll sing it in a minute. Sinner, heed the warning voice. Make the Lord your final choice. Then all heaven will rejoice. Be in time. Think of the warning, friend. Judgment is coming. It's coming for the, the unrighteous of this world. Every saved person will end up in the judgment of God. Friend, I pray it's not you. I pray there's not a soul here in Ballyclare Gospel Hall that loses their soul. Goes out to a, goes out to an eternity of God's judgment. A way of escape. God has provided a way of escape for you, friend. None may perish. All may live. For Christ has died. Get focused upon Him tonight. He can heal your every sin. He has paid the penalty for your sin in His own precious blood. You can be saved if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. God's word says, Thou shalt be saved. May God bless His word to us. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Our Father, we come before Thee. We thank thee for another time the gospel has been sounded forth in Ballyclare. Though feebly, we pray that thou may bless it. We remember the souls that are sitting here and have heard it often and know it so well. We pray that even tonight that, these, the, that their sins might cause a great burden in their hearts, that they might turn to thee for salvation, that they might confess their sin to thee and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee for a way of escape. We thank thee for one who has borne our sin in his own body upon the tree. We pray that even tonight that his name might be glorified in heaven, that heaven might ring out with the sound of angels declaring that a soul has been saved in Ballyclare. We ask our Father that thou might save and take us to our homes in safety. In the Lord's holy and precious name, amen.